Good evening everyone and welcome to Monday Night Live at our new time slot of 8pm. I think this is our third Monday Night Live that we've done um, at 8 o'clock and I know that quite a few people on the east coast of Australia are, um, you know, we're still out and about with our horses at 7 o'clock at night and I know the new time slot is really starting to... Um, work for a lot of people so um i i'm really glad about that and uh i look forward to having you all on tonight uh i myself was out in my paddock until half past seven tonight so i know that with this beautiful light that we're out working with our horses or well, hopefully we've got the opportunity to work with our horses um, into the evening. So um, I'm really excited about this new time slot. Uh, I've got a few of you starting to log in already. Hey Ruth, thanks very much for checking in. Once you've logged in, please let me know you're here by ticking, um, you know, hitting the thumbs up or hitting the like button or saying hello or whatever it is. Um, Tonight we're going to talk about uh, trust being a two-way street. So uh, this is a topic that it, it kind of started, uh, you know, quite frequently I get into our, hey Angie, hey Lisa, thanks for joining us. Um, quite often uh, in the lead up to Monday Night Lives, I will get into our um, little private group that we've got for people who have been to um, Tanya Krause Horsemanship Clinics in the past and I will say, hey guys, you know, what do you want to hear me talk about? Uh, give me a topic, etc, etc. Sometimes I put it on the public Tanya Krause Horsemanship page, sometimes I put it on my private page, whatever. Uh, so one of the topics that had been listed was how do I build confidence in my horse or how do I prepare my horse for the basic things of, um, you know, clipping, washing, picking up their feet, giving them needles, all that kind of stuff that comes up. Uh, and it was coming from a, um, it came from a lady that owns a stud. She breeds a lot of horses. So it was coming from that young horse perspective. How do I get these horses really confident in this stuff so I can um, make sure that they're okay with it when I finally, uh, when I finally try and wash them or, you know, do whatever I do. Um, so I started to prepare tonight's Monday Night Live on preparation, you know, getting getting horses ready for clipping or washing or whatever and how we build confidence around those things. And then I, I was kind of drawn to another kind of aspect, which was something that has um, occurred to me only uh, something that I've seen that's really, really noticeable, and it's probably because I've been tagged in a few posts. So thank you guys for those of you who tag me um, as being someone to contact for people who post in these big, huge Facebook groups on, um, you, you know, that are like, you know, probably the horse hub and like big question groups. So someone posts a question in there and they say, what do you reckon? And um, quite often I get tagged in, like the one that I got tagged in today was how do I build confidence around my horse? And then there was another one the other day um, that was of a similar vein. So, you know, how do I build confidence? You know, I've, I've come off a few times. And what I keep seeing is these posts where people have been uh, bucked off their horse or the horse is shied and they've come off or they've come off in some kind of situation. And generally what they want is to build confidence. They're starting to lose confidence around riding the horse or, or being able to ride the horse or, you know, coming off again. And um, so they're wanting to avoid that situation or they're wanting to fix that situation, so to speak. Hey, Hillary, thanks for joining. Um, so one of the first things that occurred to me in this situation, and I, and I know, you know, I've been there, I understand what it feels like. I never see, and I'm not saying that they don't happen, but I never see posts where people are saying, I've had a few stacks off my horse. How do I help my horse build confidence? Everyone's in it for themselves. Everyone's always posting posts saying, how do I build my confidence? How do I get better? How do I make it okay for me? How do I fix myself? Um, and they kind of forget that there's this other being that has been in this experience with them who, you know, doesn't 
didn't probably like the experience, doesn't like it when you fall off, doesn't like it when uh, things go wrong, and yet I, I never see questions about how do I help the horse through this situation. What I always see is how do I help myself. So I guess the number one thing is recognizing that there's two of you in this partnership and we need to actually help both of you through this situation and recognizing that the horse has probably got some um, confidence issues surrounding being ridden and things like that because they're getting these uh, negative experience stacking on one on top of the other. So uh, I guess that led me to trust is a two-way street because um, – we need to be aware that the horse needs to have confidence and trust in us as well as us needing to have confidence and trust in the horse. So it's not all about us saying, yep, I'm feeling it, I feel good, uh, I'm ready to get on. It's about us not only getting ourselves to the point where we're saying, yes, I'm confident, I'm ready to get on, but observing the horse and saying, is the horse ready for me to get on? Is the horse ready to move on from this, um, you know, move on from groundwork or preparatory work or whatever way that we um, prepare our horses for riding? So trust, we have to understand that trust is a fluctuating state um, that changes in any relationship, both human human with human and human with horse and, and, you know, dogs and, you know, any beings together in some kind of partnership or relationship or some kind of um, existence that relies on um, each other, what we have to understand is that the levels of trust are constantly fluctuating depending on previous experiences. So what I want to talk about or what, what I want to start with is that um, – depending on what happened with our horse last week and the week before and the week before is changing his level of trust in us and his idea about whether he can trust us. And it's not a conscious thought process, the same as it isn't for us. Um, if I can just switch it over to humans for, for a minute. Um, if, if I'm in a relationship with someone, be it a friend or a partner or a parent or a sibling or whatever, and, um, one, you know, we've been going on for, uh, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks and, and, you know, we've gone to the beach and we've gone to the park and we've driven in the car and we've, you know, we've gone to all these different places and there's all these, um, it, there's all these experiences happening that build and build and build and with it on top of each other and everything has gone to plan, then there is, um, a, a, a consistent level of trust being built and being maintained in that relationship. So say I'm all of a sudden in the car with my brother and, um, you know, up until this point, I've always trusted him. He's a good driver, etc., etc. And all of a sudden he makes a decision to put his foot down at an orange light instead of brake at an orange light. And he was a little bit late in, in making that decision. And so as we went through that light, it happened to be red and the cars started coming and we had a near miss. Well, quite soon almost immediately, my level of trust for, for my brother and his driving would drop. It may not even be a conscious decision. It's not necessarily going to be a decision that I'm going to say, oh, I no longer trust you driving. But the next time I go to get in the car with my brother, there's going to be a level of hesitation. And if I get in the car with my brother again and I have good experience after good experience after good experience after good experience and they start layering, then soon enough I'm going to get all the way back to um, trusting him again, right, as a driver because it was a one-off experience, it was a one-off thing um, and, and, you know, nothing's gone wrong. If I get in the car with my brother again and we have a good drive and then I get in the car with my brother again and we don't have a great drive and something or we have another near miss or we have another incident or we have a you know a minor bingle then my level of trust is going to go down. And again it may be conscious or it may be subconscious, but it's going to be happening because my brain that is instinctively designed to protect me is going to say, "Hmm, last time we were in the car together, there was a bad situation." And now we're in the car together again, and there's been another bad or negative situation. So my level of trust is going to be dropping. And depending on whether there's good experiences layering on that or negative experiences laying on that, 
my level of trust is going to be going up or it's going to be going down. And that's what happens with our horses. So our horse sees us and we have to understand that every single time our horse sees us, it's an experience. So whether it's a positive experience or a negative experience, we have to understand that every single time where our horse looks at us, sees us from the paddock, pull up in our car, or if we're lucky enough to have our paddock backing onto our house, we have to understand that every time our horse looks at us, they're they're building some kind of an experience. They're, it's either they're building a positive experience or they're building a negative experience. So what's happening for our horses is that they're layering, 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 whether it's positive, 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 I can trust this person, this person is, um, you know, I know that I'm going to have a positive experience here, um, then we can, um, we can maintain our level of trust in them because they've got a high level of trust. If our horse is constantly having negative experiences with us, then his level of trust is going down and down and down and down and down. And so when we're faced with a negative um, a negative experience, say a dog runs out at us or uh, we have to cross a creek crossing or we have to get in the trailer or we have to be hosed or something like that, our horse is going to react to that situation based on the, the layering development that has occurred. So what happens when the layering um, development occurs is that um, our horse is, again, making either conscious or subconscious decisions about whether he can trust us. And what we have to understand is for our horse is that he... Um, he is instinctually designed to make these micro decisions all the time as part of a herd animal. So as part of the herd, my horses are constantly making decisions. Hang on a minute. Cooper took us that way yesterday to go get our feed and we got stuck behind a fence and then we had to go all the way back out and around through the dam and through some trees and, and you know, it took us longer to get our feed than the day before when Lux led us up and we went straight to our feed. So our horses are, are designed to constantly make these micro decisions. Yes, I can trust this person. No, I can't trust this person. Yes, I had a good experience. No, I had a negative experience. So we have to we have to realize that every single time that we've we've, as I said, we, our horse is looking at us, and even more so when we've got the halter on and we're leading them and we're picking up their feet and we're brushing them and we're getting their feet done and we're putting them on the float and we're hosing them, our horse is layering experiences and they're layering opinions and they're layering whether they can trust us or not. So trust is a fluctuating um, decision, conscious or subconscious. Trust is a fluctuating decision that is based on our most recent experiences with that person or with that horse or what have you. Now, the same thing is happening for us. The reason that we develop lack of confidence or the reason we develop anxiety or the reason we develop um, concerns or fears about getting on our horse is because our past experience has been a negative one. And so our brain is saying, hey, red light, red light, red light. Last time we were here, we got kicked. Last time we were here, we fell off. Last time we were here, this happened. So our brain that is designed to protect us, our, our brain tells us, last time you were with this horse, something negative happened. And that's why we get the heart rate and that's why we get the anxiety and that's why all that things happen. And so what happens for us as people is we go, oh, I'm such an idiot. I know that it was a one-off and I know this and I know that. And that's just our um, conscious talking. That's our... Um, that's our ego talking. That's our, our, you know, our not instinct talking because our instinct is saying, hey, the last experience that we had was negative. So we need to make sure that we can trust this horse again. So that is happening for us and that is happening for the horse. And that's something that I don't see people taking on board very much. We're not always keeping in mind that the horse is layering those experiences just the way that we are. So it's very important. Number one, always remember that trust is a fluctuating experience between, um, based on past experiences, okay, and recent experiences. So if you've recently had a negative experience or your horse has recently had a negative experience, there's some rebuilding to be done. Um, one of the things that we can do to build trust with our horses is to make sure that we begin to build confidence and trust around the things that um, 
We need to build confidence and trust around the things that we may need to do in the future before we need to do them. So you guys would have heard me talk about this in regards to in previous videos. What I have said is that I like to teach my horses to lift up and get their legs bandaged before they cut themselves and they need to have their legs bandaged. I like to teach my horse to get needled before they've cut themselves or they require a shot. I like to teach my horses to tie up before I need to tie them up in order to work with them. I like to teach my horses to float before I need to get them on the trailer to take them some, somewhere. If I can teach my horse the things that he needs to know, I call it being a citizen, and you guys can check out my YouTube channel. There's quite a few videos on there already about building a citizen. If I can start to teach my horse how to be a citizen before it's uh, a necessity or before there's been a situation that I have to now say, you know, I, I always use this as an example. We had a foal born once and the mare had been running milk and we were worried about whether she, her, her colostrum levels. So the vet recommended that we go and buy um, uh, an alternative mare's milk with colostrum and give it to the foal. So what happened was the foal's first experience with humans was basically being held and wrestled with and being tubed because we had to make sure that she was going to live. It was a survival basis. And that was a, a situation that was not avoidable. We didn't have the hours to teach her how to be held and handled before we gave her the colostrum. So whilst it's a great example because you get that really good visual, uh, it's also a poor example because we didn't have the time to teach her any other way. But that horse from that day always mistrusted human beings and we had to spend a lot of time building trust and layering upon her very first opinion of humans was, whoa, I need to be careful of these people. So if you can avoid that situation and teach your foal to pick up its feet and teach your foal to accept having things around its legs and teach your foal to be kind of held but in a confident way, then if you do need to hold your foals or you do need to handle a horse, it's going to be ready to accept what you need to do in order to you know, fix an injury or, or medicate him or do whatever he does. So build towards um, the horse accepting what you may need to do in the future. Like I say, bandaging, needling, trailering, all that stuff should be taught in a quiet, confident, calm manner. The second thing that we need to do is make sure that we maintain our consistency with our horses. Probably nearly every single Monday Night Live that I have done is about it, somewhere in that Monday Night Live, I will talk about being consistent with our horses. And what I mean by that is my horse needs to know every time I turn up to the paddock, here comes Tanya, I know what to expect, I know the language she's going to use, I know how she's going to communicate with us, I'm confident that I can trust her. The way that my horses experience is that is it, I always use the same language. So whether, you know, you use positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement or positive punishment or negative punishment or what, whatever methodology you use, you need to be consistent in that methodology. You can't turn up one day and teach the horse with treats and then turn up the next day and have no treats and then turn up the next day with a whip and expect to be able to whack him into line and then turn up the next day with treats again and then turn up the next day with a whip again and expect the horse to have any kind of idea about how you're going to communicate with him. You need to be consistent. This is what I call the language. You need to make sure that you've chosen a language and you're going to stick to that language. And that language goes all the way through our, even our training methodology. You need to not only choose, um, for example, pressure and release, but you need to choose methodology that aligns with that. So if, for example, you're going to use pressure and release training, so you apply a cue, and then when the horse responds in the correct way to that cue, you're going to release on that cue, you need to look at different methodology as you progress through your training and make sure that it aligns with it. So let's use uh, side reins for an example. If you're going to use pressure and release, I apply a cue and then I release when the horse gives me the correct cue, 
side reins aren't going to align with that because you can't release the side reins, right? If you put side reins on a horse, they're going to be there during the session that you're using them for until you call the horse in and then you physically remove the side reins. So if you've adopted speaking pressure and release language with your horse, and then all of a sudden you put him out there and you put side like a restrictive device on him, he is going to panic after a certain amount of time because after a certain amount of time, he's going to realize I, I, there's no way for me to give a correct cue because this thing is tied to me, okay? It, it, there's no way that you can release it unless you call him in and take it off. And by the time you've called him in and taken it off, the, the level of time has, ha, has gone beyond his expectation of the release. So it's no longer a release. So I hope I'm making sense in that regard. The, the release has to be immediate, right? In negative... Uh, in uh, in negative reinforcement, you apply the pressure and then you release immediately as soon as the horse gets the thing correct. You don't have time to call the horse in and then undo the buckle, etc., etc., and have the horse link that to what he did in order to uh, in order for you to call him in and release the side rein. So I, I hope that that makes sense. I can clarify that later. You guys can send me a message if if it doesn't make sense, or maybe I can film like a little YouTube video or something. Um, Mopar, who's Nancy, is saying crystal clear. Thanks, Tanya. Total sense. Okay, great. So as long as as long as someone's saying that they understand it, that's wonderful. I can absolutely move on from that. So being consistent is something that is going to build trust in your horse. You've got to be consistent in who you are. Leave your baggage at the gate. If you're angry today, or if you're cranky, or if you're sad, or something's happened, you need to leave all that at the gate and be the same person every single time you interact with your horse. So he knows um he knows what it is that um he, he knows who he is communicating with okay uh abby's saying yes understood jen is saying that it understood okay so that's fantastic i'm glad that i'm making sense pardon me i've just got to take a drink okay so the next thing that we have to understand when it comes to building trust is that our day-to-day -day interaction is reflected under saddle. And I see so many people make this mistake where, um, you know, they'll say, oh, I came off my horse because of this today, or uh, it was a little windy and I came off my horse, or... Um, you know, something will happen and, and the horse will spook or the horse will react or the horse will buck under saddle. And I'll say, well, how is he when you're online um, and you're in the wind? And they'll say, oh, he's terrible. And I'll say, well, why did you get on if it was windy? If you know that he can't handle the wind when you're online, what on earth makes you think that he's going to handle the wind when you're on his back? Because when you're on his back, you're in the least leadership position that you possibly can be that is the ultimate place of trust right for me to get on a horse's back i am literally saying to that horse i trust you with my life and whether we like to whether we like to subscribe to that or believe that or or you know whether we think it's hogwash or whatever that's a reality i don't care what you're riding it i don't care if you've got a safety vest on and a helmet on and everything on your body and the horse is, you know, trained to the eyeballs and all the rest of it, as soon as you sit in that saddle, you are basically saying to that horse, hey, I trust you with my life because if I come off you, there's a chance that I could be very severely injured or I could die. And that's something that we don't like to talk about. And as horse riders, it kind of, you know, it's something that we, you know, it's not, we don't like to say it out loud and all that kind of stuff, but that's the reality. So if that's the reality, why on earth would I take a horse that is clearly um, doesn't handle the wind very well or doesn't handle um, things very well and get on them and say, oh, I trust you anyway, okay? Um, it's like getting behind the wheel with a drunk driver. Oh, I've seen you drink before. I think you can handle it. I'm going to get in the car with you. If you get in the vehicle with someone, you're saying, I trust you with my life. I trust that you are going to obey the road rules. I trust that you are going to uh, be an observant, careful driver that's looking around and making sure um, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to divert here a little bit because I was talking to, um, I think it was probably Phil. I was talking to Phil the other day about this and I said, you know, what we don't realize when we're driving, um, 
I was driving home actually, and I was very, very tired. So I hadn't been drinking or anything like that, but I think I'd probably done, might've been after the 10 day clinic or something like that. So, you know, I was pretty tired behind the wheel uh, and I didn't have far to go. And anyway, I was on the Gold Coast and I had this car full of yahoos pull out in front of me and it was probably it was you know they were pea platers so you know the driver at the very least was was fairly young there was four or five of them in the car it was quite a small vehicle and they just pulled out and i had to apply my brakes to avoid hitting them and uh you know i drive an isuzu d-max it's a little truck it's not huge or anything like that but in comparison to a barina with five people in it i was a lot more safer if we had had a collision i was a lot safer than that car full of people and i said to phil we were talking about it and i said people we we have forgotten we we have forgotten that part of driving is um us observing other people and keeping other people safe as well. So it's not only me keeping myself safe and my passengers safe, but it's also me having my wits about me and braking before I hit that car. So even though I was tired and whatever, I'm, I braked in time and there was no collision or anything like that. But had I been drink driving, then my delay, my reaction would have been a lot more delayed. Uh, and even though I wouldn't have been in the wrong, that car actually cut me off and, and, uh, and you know, I had to take um, evasive action to avoid hitting them. Obviously, if I had been drinking, I would have been in the wrong because my reactions would have been delayed. But that driver probably doesn't realize that he trusted me to preserve the lives of the people in that vehicle. So when we're being yahoos and we're driving around like maniacs, and when I say we, I'm using that hypothetically because I don't do that. But when young people are driving around like maniacs, what they probably aren't taking into consideration is that everybody else on the road, they're trusting everybody else on the road to be able to take evasive action in order to avoid hitting their vehicle. Okay, they think they're all cool and I've got my license and I know how to avoid hitting someone, but they forget about someone else being able to avoid hitting them. So that's the same as what happens with our horse is I'm saying to my horse, you know, I've got the reins, I've got the brakes, I've got all of this stuff, but I trust you to respond to my cue in time to keep us safe. I trust you to uh, listen to me when I need you to listen to me to keep us safe. So everything that we do day to day, our day to day interactions are all reflected under saddle. So if I see a horse that is not confident being hosed, then I think to myself, why would I ride that horse? If he can't even handle being hosed, why would I ride it? If he can't trust me enough to get on the trailer, why would I ride it? If he can't trust me enough to, to lead down the road, why would I ride it? I had exactly this experience the other day. I was working with Galliano, my um, warm blood. She's coming back into work because I'm taking her to the, uh, the cult start in January that I'm running. She's going to be the horse that I'm starting. And uh, so I've started to bring her in and just do a, a few little things with her, basically to prepare her uh, to get on the float so we can get to the venue, right? Um, so I took her away from the herd the other day and I was just doing a few little ground exercises and she was worried. She was like, I'm away from the herd. I don't like it. There's boogeymen in the bushes. There's this and that. And straight away I went red light. Why would I ride it? I would not ride. She can't trust me to go 100 meters from the herd. Why would I get on her back? So it's these day-to-day -day interactions on the ground that are going to be telling me if my horse is ready to ride. Uh, and, and that's something that we all, I don't think we pay enough attention to. If my horse doesn't want to pick up its feet to get its feet picked out or get its feet trimmed, why would I ride it? If it can't be a citizen on the ground, those to me are all little red lights that tell me, you know, you're not ready for me to trust you with my life. Um, so Abby's saying she hadn't thought of it quite that way. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and like I say, uh, as riders, as horse people, we probably don't really think of it that way. But ultimately, that's the decision we're making. Every time we throw that leg over that horse, I'm saying to that horse, I trust you with my life today. Um, because we all know that there can be, you know, severe um, consequences to having accidents off horses. Hey, Brett, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um that brings me to trusting yourself okay uh this is really important it's something that um 
I would love to have the time to have a conversation, I'd like to actually do a research paper on because I see it so often and I've spoken to a lot of guys, um, particularly probably cult starters and things like that. But now in terms of my, you know, traveling around everywhere and giving clinics, I meet a lot of people. Unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to meet a lot of people that have had accidents. But I do meet a lot of people that have been in accidents with their horses or accidents with a previous horse. And when we start to talk about the accident, probably nine times out of 10, they will say to me, in hindsight, I knew the horse wasn't okay, but I got on anyway. And when I'm talking to um, the general riding population, and, and by that I mean the non-professional population, um, people who just have horses for pleasure and things like that, um, they will still say, you know, I had butterflies or, you know what, it was windy and my horse was acting strange. or it, But they're picking this stuff up in hindsight, okay? So at the time they kind of went, I think it'll be okay. But still they're saying it. They're saying in hindsight there was clues, but I didn't pick up on the clues. When I speak to professionals, when I speak to cult starters and, and guys that start horses, under saddle breakers, whatever you want to call them, and they've had accidents, I say to them, oh, how did it happen? You know, what, what was the situation? Every single one that I've spoken to has said to me, Tanya, I knew the horse wasn't ready and I got on anyway. And we all have these pre-flight checks or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and when I say we all, I mean professionals who, who start horses for a living or ride horses for a living. Uh, we all have pre-flight checks that we do to see if the horse is ready to be ridden in one way, in one form or another. And every single cult starter, every single professional that I've spoken to that has had an accident and I've asked them about the circumstances of the accident has said to me, I knew the horse wasn't ready, but I did it anyway. So you need to trust yourself. You need to be able to say to yourself, to your friends, to your family, whoever it is that you think that you need to talk to, you need to be able to say to them with confidence, my horse isn't ready right now. I'm not getting on. We're not, I'm sorry. You can go on the trail ride on your own or you can go on the beach on your own or I'll lead the horse or you go without me or whatever it is. Most of the time we struggle with this because all of us have a little thing called our ego and our ego gets in the way and goes, you'll be all right. Oh, you don't want to look embarrassed in front of your friends. Everybody else is re ready. Hurry up and get on. Everybody else is riding. Hurry up and get on. Everybody else is doing this. So that's our ego that says we need to compare ourselves to these other people. And if they're doing it, then we must be okay. And what we need to be able to do is take a step back from that situation and go, either they've done their pre-flight checks and they know that their horse is right to get on and I know that my horse isn't right to get on, or... They've done their pre-flight checks. They've ignored any signals that is telling them that their horse is not okay to get on and they're getting on anyway, which is a red flag in itself. So what, what I'm saying is they're taking a risk. They're saying to themselves, I've done this. My horse is telling me it's not ready, but I'm with a group of friends, so I'm going to get on anyway. Don't be that guy. Don't be that person that has to come to a course and say to me, Tanya, I had a stack. And I say to you, oh, that's terrible. What happened? And you go, you know what? I knew the horse wasn't ready, but everyone was waiting for me. And so I got on anyway. Okay, don't be that person. Trust yourself and be okay with saying, my horse isn't ready. I'll catch up with you guys, or I'm going to go home and sort it out, or what, whatever the circumstances are. Trust yourself, trust your instinct. You know, human beings, we don't use our instincts very much. Um, but we need to we need to start tapping into that, especially when we're trusting a horse, and uh, we need to be able to be okay with that situation. Um, so Deb's saying this so relates to me and my horse. Trust has been the number one issue, and it's taken us a long time to trust each other. We are making progress. Becoming a strong leader is not easy to do. How do you stop second guessing yourself as to whether you've done the right thing? And now Facebook is not going to show me the rest of your message. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, how to stop second guessing yourself? Well, I guess it, you start out by saying better safe than sorry. So you start out by being okay with, um, being overcautious 
And um, the more you take the time to do your pre-flight checks or whatever with your horse, pardon me, the more that you'll be able to make the decisions and read the horse's body language, okay? So that probably brings me, yeah, it does. It brings me exactly to the next thing that I was going to talk about. Um, or one more thing on the trust yourself. What do you have to lose by trusting yourself and walking away from a situation? A little bit of face, a little bit of ego, I don't know. What do we have to lose if we walk away? What do we have to lose if we push through it? A lot, okay? We could have an accident. We could, um, ha you know, we could be um, in hospital for a long time or worse. We could never come back from it. We could be permanently injured or permanently dead from a situation. So as far as I'm concerned, when I ask myself, what have I got to lose on each side of that thing, on the overcautious side, yeah, I don't have that much to lose. On the over cocky side, like it'll be right, I've got a lot to lose. I'm putting a lot of eggs in that basket in terms of my future and my family's future and my friends and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's better to be safe than sorry. So the next thing that that brings me to is my final point, which is being present. So reading the horse's body language and most of the time you're going to be able to tell whether you're going to be okay or not. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is the longer you spend with your horse and the more experiences you have with your horse, the more you're going to be able to read him in a way that you, you know, you can read your you know, back to human relationships. You can read your parent. You can read your kids. You can read your partner. You can read the people in your life. You know, I can open my eyes in the morning and, um, you know, uh, uh, Phil can say, what's wrong? Or good morning. Or, hey, are you okay? Or whatever. Because it, I don't even have to open my mouth and he can tell just from being there whether I'm okay or whether I'm super happy or he'll be like, what are you, what are you thinking about? You know, what, you know, what, what's on your mind this morning? Um, so the longer we spend with our horse being present, the only way we get to know these things about our, ourselves and our, uh, our, the people in our lives is by spending time with them, but being present with them. That's how we learn to read their body language and their little idiosyncrasies. Um, the more time we get to spend with our horse reading them and reading their little idiosyncrasies, the quicker and easier it's going to be up, be for us to judge, hey, there's something not right with you today, or oh, you look fine to me today, or you're happy, or you're interested, or you've got a little bit of, of energy, or you seem a little flat, or whatever it is. So the more time um, you allow yourself to be present and the more time you allow yourself to just read that horse's body language, the more effectively you're going to be able to read him and understand what he's ready for and um, you know what you'll be able to move on to in that day. So some days I can walk out to Cooper and I can go, I can get on this horse straight away. And then some days I can walk out and go, oh, he's not ready to get on straight away today. Need to do some ground exercises and get him in the office. Uh, and I can smile about that now because I can read that horse like a book. Um, and, you know, I can, I, I'm, I'm pretty much, there's no guarantees. There's, there's never any guarantee when it comes to a horse because we don't know if a chopper's not going to, you know, Phil was somewhere the other week and he had, not only did he have a chopper that was checking uh, power lines fly over the top of him, but then he had um, he was near an airport and he had um, fighter jets like go really low over him and George, both in the same riding session. So you can never know exactly what's going to happen in a riding session. But the more um, time that you spend with your horse and the more time you spend being present and observing your horse, the, the quicker and easier it will be for you to make decisions based on, uh, you know, what information is coming back to you. Um, so Hillary is saying, this was so me at Jump Club. I had nothing to prove and I took Oscar home. And now, you know, she's here to tell the tale and Oscar's here to tell the tale and, you know, we're here to... Um, you know, have him at Liberty Clinic last week and I saw that Steve um, had a lesson on him in the other day and uh, I saw Hillary saying that he wasn't he wasn't so great at the start of the clinic, but by the end of the clinic, he was fine. So, you know, this is, this is about making these decisions to keep both you and your horse having a positive experience. So if Oscar was experiencing a negative day 
and Hillary had gone push forward and said, I'm going to ride you anyway, then potentially there was going to be an incident. Potentially Hillary would come off. Potentially that would scare Oscar. And then we'd be back to square one because we'd have to rebuild that trust again. So instead, what happened was she said, you know what? You're not okay. I'm not going to push through it. I'm going to put you on the float and take you home. There's always tomorrow. These are the types of decisions that we can make in order to keep us and our horses safe. So trust is absolutely a two-way street. Um, I hope that this Monday Night Live has given you um, some information and some insights and probably not, not so much skills or drills or anything like that. What, I, what I'm hoping that tonight has given you is just another thought process um, uh, in, in considering the horse or putting the horse first in the equation. You know, we, like I said, we always tend to think about us and what our experiences w were um, in regards to negative experiences that we've had with our horses, um, but we don't always take into consideration where the horse is at in regards to those negative experiences. So I really appreciate you all joining me. I hope that you're all enjoying the new 8 o'clock time slot. Uh, of course, it's 8 o'clock in New South Wales. It's only 7 p.m. in Queensland. Land. Um, but I hope that everyone, I hope this new time slot is suiting everyone. We're going to, we're going to hold on to this new time slot all the way through summer. Uh, I look forward to seeing those of you uh, who are coming to the balance and transitions clinic at Glen Ray this weekend. I look forward to having you all, um, there. Um, Abby's saying it can take a really long time to learn to read your horse. Absolutely it can. Uh, Deb's saying, thank you. Great advice. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't read all your comment. I hope I did. Um, it, 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 even though I couldn't read all of it, I hope I did address it um, and, and you got some stuff out of it. Abby's saying the new time slot's great. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone has a great week with their horses. Please send me any topics that you would like to cover on that you would like to see me cover on monday night live um also on my new youtube channel and we've got some really other cool exciting things in the works we do a newsletter as well and there's one little thing that i'm i'm getting ready to launch um which will be another source of information for you guys i'm all about trying to get information out there but i do need the topics to talk about so please take the time to send me a message you might not think that i will want to cover it but in one of my four mediums I'm sure I'll be able to cover it or even in a clinic situation I might be able to cover it so anything that you are struggling with or find challenging or have a question about with your horse please send it through and I will endeavor to get it out on a, or in some kind of um, method so um, Anna's saying looking forward to listening to this so she must have only just logged on so we are finished for the night happy Monday everyone and I will see you all through the week and on Facebook bye